right, good morning. I want to invite you to take God's Word and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And uh, as you're turning there, and I'm going to put this cough drop in, I'm nursing my voice uh, this morning, and so bear with me. If We'll get through it, okay? I promise you we will. I'm putting this cough drop in. It reminds me, first time I was ever preaching, um, I was preaching at my grandparents' church in South Mississippi, and I was nervous. It was one of my first times to ever preach. I was probably 17, 18 years old. And my Paul Paul, this was his church, and um, I guess he wanted to give me some words of wisdom before I was preaching that morning. And he said, uh, son, uh, I want you to take this mint. And he gave me a mint. And he said, when you get up to preach, I want you to put this in your mouth. And he said, when it's done, you're done. <laughs> that, was his, <laughs> that was his words of encouragement to me. So I'm putting this cough drop in. When it's done, we'll be done, all right? Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I hope you've enjoyed this good news Christmas message series. We're finishing it up today and then heading right into the Christmas Eve services here on the 24th. And if you're in town, I really want to encourage you to be here. We'll have two services, uh, one at four, one at six. You'll want to get here early. Uh, our team met on Tuesday of this week uh, together and Right before we had our staff Christmas party, we prayed, and then we went out in the neighborhood, and we passed out. We put on nearly 3,000 doors uh, surrounding our community, inviting people to our Christmas Eve services, and we believe it's going to be just one of the best services of the year. And so I want to encourage you to come. It's going to be an hour long, okay? I promise you, an hour long. We're going to sing carols of Christmas. Uh, who doesn't like singing the carols? If you don't like singing the carols of Christmas, all right, you're just a Grinch, and you need to get over it. Uh, It's the carols of Christmas, and then we're going to have a little children's devotional. I mean, it's going to be old school children's church, so it's going to be organized chaos. We're going to ask all the kids to come down and sit right here, and there's going to be a little, we're going to do a little children's church for about five or seven minutes with them. It's going to be awesome, and then uh, we'll have some special music. I'm going to preach about an 18-minute message, all right? I'm already working on it. Can't wait for that. And then we're going to light candles and sing Silent Night and uh, walk out of here looking forward to celebrating the birth of our Savior the very next day. It is going to be great. So I really want to encourage you, uh, if you have family members and friends coming in town, get them here. Uh, It'll be worth an hour of their time, I promise you. We've looked the last several weeks in detail at Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And the Bible says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, talking to the shepherds who were watching over their flock in the fields of Bethlehem. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now in week one, we discussed the context surrounding this passage, and we looked specifically at the content of this good news, what it consisted of, what it meant. And then last week we came back and talked about why it brings such great joy uh, to people who hear this message and ultimately receive this message. And this week we're going to look at the final phrase there in verse 10. It's also the title of the message today. It's a powerful phrase, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you, and I just want us uh, to say it together. Are you ready? Here we go. For all the people. For all the people. It really is an incredible thought that the message of good news that God has left the confines of heaven and come to earth, he's wrapped himself in flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, it brings such great joy, and this message is for everyone. It is universal in its scope. Now, we know this. One of the most loved and well-known Bible verses in all of the Bible, if you haven't grown up in church, even you are familiar with John 3.16, where the scripture says, For God so loved the what? world he so loved the world that he gave his only son we've been saying this a lot around here uh, this december is god is spirit no one's ever seen god but if you could open up and see the spirit of god's heart if you will you would see the heart of a giver for god so loved the world every single person in the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is God's gift to the world, and he is the perfect gift for anyone walking the earth today. Now, I know uh, that probably all of us have people in our life that we're shopping this time of year for Christmas gifts, and they're just hard to get for. Anybody have somebody like that in their life? They just seem to have it all. You don't really know what to get them, or they don't tell you what they need. And so trying to find them the perfect gift is just really, really hard. So 
Uh, I brought you some ideas today for some gifts uh, right out of the 12 Days of Christmas, 12 Days of Christmas song. For 30 years, uh, the company PNC Financial Services has price indexed the gifts in the 12 Days of Christmas song. So if you're looking for the perfect gift, let, let me just uh, give you some, and, and if you want to go this direction, be ready. You might have to shell out some cash, all right? If you want a partridge in a pear tree, that's going to cost you $222.68. Two turtle doves, it's going to cost you $450. Three French hens, the going rate for them, $255. Four calling birds, $599.96. Five gold rings, it's up 8.5% due to retail price increases this year. They're $895. If you're looking for six geese a-laying, $660. Seven swans of swimming this price has remained the same since 2019, so that's good flat rate here. $13,125. Eight maids of milking. Federal minimum wage hasn't changed, so this rate stayed the same. $58. Nine ladies dancing. They weren't available last year due to the pandemic, but they've returned. Same price as 2019, $7,552. Ten lords of leaping. It's going to cost you $11,260. 11 Pipers Piping, $2,943.93, and 12 Drummers Drumming, $3,183.17. Now, if you put all of these gifts together in the repetitions of the gifts, it totals 364 presents, and you put it all together, it would cost you $179,454.19, all right? The perfect gift from the 12 Days of Christmas song. All of us want to get people that we know and love the perfect gift gift. We'll pay extraordinary amounts of money to see that gift that fits that person best. Well, the point we're making today is that in Jesus, God gave a priceless gift. And he is the perfect gift for every person that walks the earth. His gift is for all the people. And here's what I want to show you in today's message. I want to show you how this gift for all the people was in the heart of God from the very beginning. And then what I want us to do in the end of our time together is to just personalize it. And I want to show you from the scripture that regardless of what your background is or what you may be struggling with or dealing with today, uh, this priceless gift that's for all the people is for you. And I want to personalize it as we close today. So let's get to work and see how this gift of Jesus is for all of the people and was in the heart of God from the very beginning. And to do so, we've got to go all the way back to the very beginning. So turn in with me to your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now you know what happens here in Genesis chapter 3. God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates uh, every living creature. And on the day before he rests, day seven, on day six, he creates man and woman, the crowning achievement of his creation. And they're told to be fruitful and multiply the earth. But there's one thing God tells them they are not to do, and that is they are not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's found in the midst of the garden. That's the one thing they are to stay away from you. In, in our freedoms, there's always limitations. Well, you know the story. They're tempted by the serpent to eat of the tree, and they do so. Their eyes are open. They sin against God. They immediately know something has changed. They hide from him. They feel the shame for the first time they've never felt. And as a result, the curse of the fall ensues. Uh, for Adam, his work is going to get tougher. For Eve, childbearing is now because of sin, going to get more painful. I'm sorry, ladies. There'll be a struggle now in the most intimate of relationships between the wife and the husband. And then God curses the serpent, which we know is a manifestation of Satan himself. 
And we read of the very first prophecy regarding the Messiah to come way back in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Scholars call this the the first gospel, if you will. The proto-euangelion. It's the first glimpse we see of this gift that God will send to the earth, and this gift will be a person. Important to understand that if God is to be for all the people. He's going to show his love by actually becoming a person. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity, that's strife, that's war. There will be a battle between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve. Between your offspring, Satan, that's the enemy and unbelievers, and her offspring, ultimately Jesus. When you Turn to Luke chapter 3 and you read the genealogy. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. This is why those genealogies are so important. He shall bruise your head. That's a death blow. This is a picture of the cross. And you shall bruise his heel. It's a wound, but it's not a moral wound. It speaks of the suffering of Christ. So way back from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, we see this first glimpse of a Savior to come. And this Messiah, this Christ, this anointed one who will crush the enemy's head, the serpent's head, we see he will be human offspring that will deliver mankind. Now, we don't know much about this Savior deliverer, this offspring, until we get to Genesis chapter 12. And so just go over to Genesis chapter 12, and we see the call of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1, listen to what the Bible says. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And I want you to underline this, because here we see for the very first time that this offspring From this offspring, all the families of the earth, do you see it? In you, all the families of the earth, all the people shall be blessed. So in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 12, from the very beginning, we see that the promised one to come will be of the offspring of Eve. It will be a human being from the lineage of Abraham. This Messiah, this Christ, we'd be of Jewish descent. It was never meant to be a secret, never a secret, that Jesus came first and foremost to the Jewish people. The prophets foretold this. Paul, who was a Pharisee, trained in the law, he mentions this. Romans chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, listen to what Paul would write. They are Israelites, Jewish people, and to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, The giving of the law, the worship, the promises, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. Again, this is one of the reasons that we see in the lineage, Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, goes to extreme detail to show us the Messiah, Jesus is from Jewish descent, and while he came to save the world, he was for all the people. From a priority standpoint, he came first to the Jews. Paul would say, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And so Jesus came to the world, for everyone. From the very beginning, this was in the heart of God. He would be an offspring of Eve, offspring of Abraham, and you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But for the most part, the Jewish people didn't accept the Messiah, still don't today. John would put it like this, John chapter 1, verse 11. Jesus, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. They were blinded spiritually. Their heart was hardened. 
They didn't believe. Scripture would say, Jesus would say, you have eyes but don't see. You have ears but don't hear. The majority of the Jewish world doesn't believe to this day that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still waiting on him. And this is what makes Christmas so important is that we look at the Scripture and we see that the Christ, the anointed one of God, the Messiah, is indeed Jesus. And he came not just to the Jews, but he came to the Gentiles as well. And this was in the heart of God from the very beginning. God didn't change his mind one day when the Jews, for the most part, rejected him and said, I guess I'll just go to the Gentiles. No, it's from the very beginning. In you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we are children of Abraham because the scripture teaches Abraham believed God and it was credited unto him as righteousness. And so all of us who believe in God By faith, we believe in Christ. We are children of Abraham as well. And so in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This was in the heart of God from the beginning for all the people. When Jesus was presented at the temple, there was an older man there named Simeon who the Bible describes as righteous and devout. And the Bible tells us that he was full of the Holy Spirit And he was promised that he would not die before he saw the Messiah. In Luke chapter 2, Joseph and Mary bring the infant Jesus in. And look at what Simeon does. Look at what he says. Talk about a baby dedication. Look at verse 27. The scripture says this in Luke chapter 2. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. And look at verse 32. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The gift of Jesus was always for all the people. Just look at the ministry of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 8, he heals a man filled with demons who's a, a Gentile. In Luke chapter 17, he heals a Samaritan leper. In John chapter 4, he gives a water, living water, a, a woman from Samaria, living water. Matthew chapter 15. He wonders, the Bible says, at the faith of a Canaanite woman because of the faith that she expresses. In Matthew chapter 8, he heals a Roman centurion servant. The last words of Jesus we know as the Great Commission. He shows he is a gift to the world. Listen to what Matthew 28, 19 says. Go, therefore, and make disciples, look at this, of all nations. That's all ethnicities. That's all people groups. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has always been God's gift to the world. We see this in the book of Acts. We studied it this whole fall. Uh, The disciples take the gospel from Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We get to Acts chapter 8 and we see Samaria rejoicing that Jesus is the Messiah. We see a, a man from Ethiopia coming to believe and taking the gospel back to Ethiopia. Acts chapter 9, Saul converts, who we know as the Apostle Paul, and listen to his ministry that the Holy Spirit gives him. And the Lord said to him, go, Acts chapter 9, verse 15, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And we see throughout the rest of the Bible this this idea being underscored that the gift of Jesus is is offered to everyone who will believe in him by faith. From the very beginning, Jesus is for all the people. All the people. All the people. When I was growing up, one of the fun places to hang out when I was probably in the fifth or sixth grade was a place called Skate Bozier. All right? Roller skating rink. We didn't have those... We didn't have those thin line roller blades. We had the four wheels with the little orange rubber stopper. You know what I'm talking about? Man, we'd go there. They'd play those hits from the 80s. I've told you before, you wouldn't believe how fast I could skate to those hits from the 80s. But the one thing I couldn't do was skate backwards. 
couldn't skate backwards. And they'd have, a, they'd have a thing where they'd say, hey, this is just for all you couples. This is a couple skate. And if you didn't have a couple, you're just left over on the sideline to do nothing. Watch all the ones with couples roller skate backwards. They were so cool, man. I just wanted to be able to skate backwards and be a couple on the couple skate. After it was over, you'd hear this. Now it's time for the all skate. This is an all skate. And what happens? Everybody comes out on the floor and they can start roller skate. Well, in Jesus, it's an all skate. It's for everybody. Uh, he is for all the people. And he's not just classification for Jew and Gentile. He's for, he's for all social structures in that classification. Meaning he's for the rich and for the poor. He's for the successful, the outcast. He's for the powerless and the weak. The religious and the non-religious, Jesus is for all the people. Is there anything worse than being left out? I mean, you remember growing up as a kid and you'd have to pick teams and you know what it was like to be left out? I mean, to be the last one picked? I don't remember what it was like. I was always, no, I, I, you know what I'm talking about. You know what it was like. Not fun. Even today, social media. Come on now, you look through social media and you see a group out to dinner and you're thinking, I thought I was a part of that group. They didn't invite me. They didn't ask me. Nothing worse than being left out. Well, in Jesus, God didn't leave anyone out. He invites everyone to come to know him. And we see this in the Christmas story that he doesn't let anyone out. I mean, just highlight it. Who does the message first come to? It comes to the shepherds. They were outcasts. They were no names. They were considered unreliable. Their testimony wasn't even allowed in court. They were considered ceremonially unclean. Couldn't even go to worship at the temple. And yet Jesus is for them. Anybody here feel like an outcast? Anybody here feel like a, a no-name? Anybody here feel like you're not important? I'm just telling you, the gift of Christmas is for you. Jesus is for you. Look at the genealogy. Matthew chapter 1. I mean, talk about some knots on a family tree. I've always been scared to do that Ancestry.com because I don't know what I would find. I'd be terrified what I'd find. But they lay it all out there. You got Tamar, Canaanite, pagan, posed as a prostitute. You got Rahab, pagan prostitute. Ruth, a Moabite woman. She was an idolater as a Moabite. Bathsheba committed adultery with King David. Yet they're all in the family tree of Jesus. Anyone here today feel like you've gone too far? Feel like you're too dirty for Jesus to love? Feel like you've done too much? Gone too far? I'm just telling you. What the Christmas story shows is that Jesus came for you too. The gift of Jesus is for everyone. For the outcast and the sinner. The one who is dirty and unworthy. He's for the down and out. He's also for the up and out. That's what we see with the wise men. I mean, these wise men, they were prestigious they were wealthy they see a star arise maybe they were studying the prophecies like numbers chapter 24 verse 17 that a star shall come out of jacob and a scepter shall rise out of israel these are gentiles these wise men again in the heart of god from the very beginning he is for all the people and they travel from long distances to see this newborn king of the jews probably from persia or babylon Travel with a large group of servants and attendants. And our Christmas Spectacular, they came on camels and elephants. We might have taken a little bit of liberty with that, I don't know. These were men who were prestigious, wealthy, and wise. And this good news of great joy is for them as well. I mean, in our context... Especially comparing us to the world standards, everybody in here is wealthy. So often, it's the wealthy who feel like they don't need Jesus. Because they got everything. Yet the reality is, you know as well as I do, when you pillow your head at night, if you don't know Christ, whatever it is 
that you're searching for answers just like these wise men. You're on a search and you're trying to find it in pleasure and you're trying to find it in the next relationship and you're trying to find it in the next payday. Do you know when you pillar your head at night, there's no peace. There's no soul rest. Only comes from knowing Christ. And I'm telling you, you could be down and out like the prostitutes mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 or you can be up and out like the wise men either way you're out you need Jesus and I'm telling you Jesus is for you Christmas story shows it he's for the religious that's Mary and Joseph the scripture tells us Joseph was a just man Mary found favor with God we see him 40 days after the birth of Jesus taking him to the temple in Jerusalem just as the law of Moses commanded. They were no doubt very religious, devout, and yet even in their religion, they needed a Savior. Mary would pray in her Magnificat, seeing Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices, look at this, in God, my Savior, my Savior. Mary was religious, but she too needed a Savior. And you can be here today and be the most religious person in the world, but if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you too need a Savior. Religion, religion can be the most tiresome thing in the world. Trying to be good, trying to be moral, trying to appease God. Feel like you're on this treadmill of performance that you can't get off of. This is why Jesus came. He came for you and to you so that you could see that it's not about religion. That's never going to be the answer, but it's about a relationship with him. This gift is for all the people, for Jew, for Gentile, for outcast, for wealthy, for sinners, for the religious, the non-religious. It's good news of great joy for all the people. And don't miss this. This gift for all the people means you. This gift is for you. For you. And what you find is you unwrap this gift, you find unconditional love, you find forgiveness of sin, you find what it means to be in a right relationship with God. And so what do we do with this gift? That's for all the people. Let me suggest three things as we bring this message to a close. Number one is receive the gift. If you've never received the gift of Jesus into your life, you need to do it today. Very next verse in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. For unto you. Unto you. It doesn't do us any good to be aware of the gift, acknowledge the gift, talk about the gift. What matters is when we take the gift and it becomes ours. Listen, it doesn't matter how old you get. When there's a Christmas gift with your name on it, your ears perk up, doesn't it? Whoever you assign as little elves passing out the gifts, they say your name, kind of perk up. That's me. Well, Jesus is a gift with your name on it. I told every single person at Christmas Spectacular, we talk about God so loved the world, personalize that and put your name there. For God so loves you. And all you have to do is receive the gift by faith. And the Bible teaches that your life is changed forever. John chapter 1 verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. All you have to do is receive the gift. I got a gift right here. And I promise we did not talk about this at the beginning of this service. But I need my buddy Easton to come on up here. Easton, I need you to come on up. But he has no idea that he's doing this. None. I just fist bumped him before the service. Come on up. Y'all give Easton a hand. Easton, how you doing, bud? All right, turn this way. We didn't talk about this before the service, did we? No, not at all. He has no clue that I'm doing this. Thank you for doing this. Mom has no clue, but thank you so much. Okay, Easton, this is your gift, all right? I promise. Bought it. I want you to take it, open it up, show everybody what's yours. You take it home, play with it. Hope you like it. Look at that little Nerf basketball hoop. You take that, you'll play with that. Is that cool? All right, perfect. Y'all give him a hand. I want you to take it. It's yours. That's all there is to it. Look at that. 
Now, I want you to notice not one time. Did you notice Easton didn't bargain with me? He didn't say, well, what can I get you? He didn't say, uh, are you sure? Um, he didn't try to give it back. What did he do? He did what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to receive the gift. I wanted him to take it. No questions asked. How often, here we are as adults, we make things so complicated. God gives you his greatest gift in the person of Jesus Christ, and we want to ask questions, we want to debate, we want to think about it, we want to try to pay him back, we want to try to bargain with him. We want to try to put it on maybe a shelf and just forget about it, come back to it later when you've got this incredible gift you can take home, and it can be yours today simply by receiving it by faith. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're here today and don't know Christ, receive him today. He's the greatest gift God's ever given. Secondly, enjoy the gift. Let me explain. What brings me more joy as a father in giving gifts to my children? I come home from a trip, I've got a souvenir for them, or even this Christmas I'll give them a gift. What gives me joy as a father? Is it not to see them enjoying the gift? Like, seeing them play with the gift, use the gift that I've given them? What would break my heart is for them to just toss it over to the side and never return to it, not be important to them. Well, this is what God wants us to do with the gift of Jesus Christ. He wants us to enjoy his presence in our life. When we receive him into our life, he wants us to enjoy him. I mean, what pleasure it must bring God to look down and to see us today worshiping him. Or when we give, giving with such joy in our hearts because of the way that God has blessed us, that must bring him such pleasure. He must, he must look down upon us and smile when we come to him in prayer, when we open up his word and study. It must bring him such joy when we enjoy his presence. The Bible says, Psalm 16, 11, in your presence, God, is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It must bring him such pleasure, such joy, for us to just enjoy the gift of Christ in our life. And yet the tragedy is so often we treat Jesus like we treat Elf on a shelf. And we just put him up there, and someday he, he, he come, you know, we come back, and, he, and he's still up there on the shelf. And it's Jesus on a shelf. And we never do anything with him. He just sits there on the shelf. How much joy we're forfeiting. How much peace we're forfeiting. How much abundance of life we're forfeiting. All because we're not enjoying the greatest gift that God's ever, been, ever given us. And so I want to encourage you to enjoy the gift of Christ. What point is having him in our life if we're not enjoying his presence? So receive the gift, enjoy the gift, and then finally, re-gift the gift. You know where I'm going with this, right? You get a present you don't want, can't use. Some of you are re-gifters. <laughs> you put it away. You just re-gift the gift. Well, Christ... I mean, sure sign of Christian maturity is when we start re-gifting the gift and giving it to others. And every time we share Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, every time we share with someone the good news of Christ, we're re-gifting the gift. The gift of Jesus is for all the people. And when we come to know him, when we receive him, the very first thing we want to do, it's a, it's a sign that we've been saved, is to re-gift the gift. And so, closing applicational question for you is this. Who can you re-gift the gift to this week? There's somebody in your life that you work with, that you go to school with, that's in your neighborhood, what better time than right now, celebrating Christmas, the birth of Christ, to re-gift the gift. You tell people about Jesus this season. I promise you, uh, they'll listen in. 
And I close with this question. Again, it's personal. It's simply this. Have you received the gift? This is what Christmas is all about. Receiving the gift of Christ and re-gifting the gift of Christ. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God, to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforest.org slash connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus, in person, on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.